Let's just open with a word of prayer. Lord, we've come tonight uh, in this room to call heaven to earth. Thank you for the privilege of being a house of prayer. As a part of this evening tonight, we come to uh, look at life and how life affects us. And so uh, thank you for the folks that are in this room tonight. Would you minister by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so Larry and Rhonda Eyrig are uh, the vice presidents of, of, is that me, of Grace International. You want to give me a mic there? Okay. It's a gift. It's a gift. Um, uh, the Vice Presidents of Grace International, uh, they actually pastor a, our church in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, on top of that is the church Becky and I started 50 years ago in March. And uh, in fact, we're going to go back in May and be a part of the uh, 50th anniversary of that uh, particular congregation. Larry and Rhonda have also walked through some very difficult times. Uh, you might not know that if you just spoke with them and uh, you saw how they handled life or you were at the church and saw what God's doing there because he's doing amazing things there just like what's happening here. God is, the church is flourishing. But uh, they are back here uh, because Becky is, uh, uh, anyway, uh, so, when I'm out of the reach of her cane, I'll finish that sentence. Um, and so I, I asked them if they would uh, take the time tonight to talk about something that all of us encounter. What happens when life isn't fair? And you walk through things that, from human perspective, you, you, there are really no answers. How do you deal with those kinds of times? So welcome tonight, Larry and Rhonda Eyrig. So there would be, obviously, a number of things they could share about, but there are two specific uh, uh, situations that tonight we're going to talk about, and uh, we're going to start with Rhonda. She'll just give a little synopsis of their grandson, and then Larry's going to talk about his recent uh, health challenges. So, Rhonda, go ahead. Okay. If you could put up that first picture, please. So, almost eight years ago, uh, we, um, this is my grandson, Caleb. Um, we're sitting in our, out on our patio, we get a phone call, and uh, he had been hit by a utility truck on his bicycle. And um, so we jumped in the car, ran down to the scene of the accident, and they were just putting him in an ambulance to put him in a life flight. We didn't know the extent of his injuries, didn't know any of that. And um, by the time we got to the hospital, they had run scans and things and determined that he had no brain function or anything. He'd been hit pretty bad. And subsequently, a few hours later, he died. And um, <clears throat> that's a really hard thing to do. He's our firstborn grandson and uh, spent a lot of time with him. And uh, he's a great kid. Show that second picture. Um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite pictures, out washing the car. Eventually, I think he was drinking out of the hose. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> but um, life just in an instant can take a turn, can be different. You don't know when. You don't know how. Um, and it may never happen in that way to any of you, but um, 
there are challenges and things that we face in life that we just never know what's, what's coming our way. And we had no idea that this would ever happen to our family. When we walked out of the hospital that morning, I've never experienced, obviously, anything like this. But when we walked out, it was still, it was about dawn. Things were just getting light a little bit. And the further we got home, the more I realized that everything was gray. I'm sure the sun was shining. I'm sure all of that was taking place. But it didn't look like that through my eyes. Everything was gray. And then you have to deal with telling your other grandchildren and your family has to go through all of this, which is, Larry explains it as a road that has no exit. And it doesn't. Um, grief is uh, different to everybody. Everybody experiences it differently. And we tell people, um, oh, you'll be okay. You'll get over this. But you don't. And you shouldn't tell people that. Because there's part of it that, um, for the most part now, after eight years, we can talk about him, we can laugh about the things that he did, because he was a funny kid. But um, there's moments that things will take place, or I'll see a picture of him that just trigger back to those, that day and make me miss him horribly. And um, Becky and I have birthdays about five days apart. And on this birthday particularly, I missed him a lot. And you can't explain those things unless you've gone through those kinds of things. But this one thing I know is that God is faithful. I don't know how people go through things like this without the Lord. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. Even in those moments when I said, God, and don't be shocked, but I questioned, why? Why now? Why him? He had all of his life to live. He's only 14 years old. All of his life left. But in those 14 years, he'd done everything just about that he had wanted to do up to that point. He'd experienced a lot of things. A lot of things he probably shouldn't have experienced. <laughs> but he was a great kid. He loved the Lord. He had the ability at church... Um, when we had kids that had special needs, he had the ability to take care of them. Just something that innately God had put in him. And he could talk with them. He, could, he loved them at school. He had friends that were that way, and he loved those kids and took care of them when the other kids wouldn't have anything to do with them. He was just a great kid. I have this picture in my mind. One day I was driving home, and I was thinking about him a lot. And I, I always wondered what the comfort of the Lord was. And it comes in different ways to different people. But that day, the Lord gave me comfort in this picture. He hated to wear a shirt. He, every time he came to our house, him and, him and his other cousin, off came the shirts. We'd bake cookies, off came the shirts. It didn't matter what we were doing. But he'd leave on the shorts he had and his socks. And uh, he'd run around the house, and they just had a lot of fun. And I had this, the Lord gave me this picture <clears throat> of him sliding into heaven with his socks, his shorts, and no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and doing this, and his grandparents looking at him going, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he's got a smile on his face. And that comforts me. That helps me to know where he is because he loved the Lord. We grieve. We have sorrow at times because we miss him. But he's not in pain anymore. He had kidney issues. He was about ready to have a kidney transplant. His mother was a perfect donor. And a couple mo a month um, after he died, he was supposed to have a kidney transplant. And he was a pretty sick little boy, but you would have never known. You'd look at him and think, he's perfectly fine. He never complained. 
He didn't take his medicine, but he never complained. He was a great kid. But it's hard. And maybe some of you here have experienced uh, going through tragedy, going through hurt like that. And you think to yourself, how do I move on? How do I live life? I know this, Caleb would want us to live life. He wouldn't have wanted us to stop. He wanted us to move on. We never forget about him. We'll never forget about him. And one day, I get to see him, which is my hope. That's the best thing ever, is that I get to see him again. I tell my grandchildren that. Actually, I threaten them with that. <laughs> I say, look, if you ever want to see Caleb again, you better serve the Lord. You better do what is right. Because that's your only hope of ever seeing him. And uh, those are the things that we have to rest in. Those are the things that we have, to, we have to get in our mind because it's the Lord is everything to me. Everything. He always has been. Becky and I were talking about that today, talking about being, calling into the, being called into the ministry. And um, I can't remember a time when I didn't love the Lord. I can't remember a time when uh, my faith wavered in the Lord. I can't remember a time where I might have said, are you sure, Lord? Are you sure? I'm not so sure I'm going to do that. But my next thing was, yes, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. Because serving the Lord is everything. And in this, if we hadn't been serving God, if I hadn't been serving God, I wouldn't have survived it. I wouldn't have gotten through it. So when good things happen to bad people, it's not necessarily because of you. I look at all the things that I've been through in my life, and a lot of it has only made me stronger, has only made my faith in God stronger has only made me more determined to do what he wants me to do and to finish well. That's my goal, is to finish well with the Lord. So Larry, you and I were actually ministering together in another part of the nation and we got back to the airport and you could barely walk and you made it on the plane and made it home, and what happened? Um, I've always been somewhat healthy, uh, but we were ministering. Just before that, I had uh, started the process of extreme weight loss. Now, to most of us, we would be very grateful for that. Um, I lost 60 pounds in five months and uh, was eating everything that wasn't nailed down, but continually losing weight, and we were speaking. Uh, when I got to the airport and they had to push me in a wheelchair, I thought something's really wrong here. And, uh, any of you men, or maybe the women would say amen to this, us guys, when we're sick, you just, you gotta work through it. Mm -hmm. We don't need no stinking doctors. <laughs> so that's how we, you know, you just push through. Our wives are telling us, well, I, I did heed what Rhonda said, and we went in. And uh, at the end of there, uh, I ended up in the emergency room, had to have three blood transfusions uh, because my, uh, my blood count was so low. They were wondering how I was able to stand. In that process uh, of checking, they found a large cancerous mass right by my pancreas and the liver. They couldn't tell if it was pancreatic or liver cancer because those are stage four and uh, you don't survive. So they did the surgery, they extracted the mass, found out it wasn't either, either of those, uh, but uh, ended up in the hospital for more than a week and then at home uh, to the point that, uh, and Ron and I, I mean, she was a great nurse, she really did take care of me. Um, we try to talk about everything, but I didn't know other than she was doing everything to help me get better. And they didn't know how long I would live. There really isn't a margin of that. They say if you make it five years and you're cancer-free that they declare you cancer-free. But it wasn't that far away from the surgery. So 
Um, I'm actually laying in bed. I couldn't get out of bed. Couldn't do anything for myself. And uh, I'm actually praying, God, don't let me die. I don't, uh, you know, all of us want to go to heaven. We just don't want to go today. <laughs> and so that's what I kept thinking. I don't want to die. I really don't. I, I enjoy life. And even the things we've been through that God's walked us through. Um, and she was very gracious and kind. What I didn't know is when she would say she was going grocery shopping, she'd drive down to the grocery store because it was a place of solace where she could sit in the car and, and pray the same thing, God, don't let him die. Now, when you think about that, if she's asking questions of the Lord, if he dies, can I stay at the church? This is where we pastor together. Uh, what am I going to do? Can I stay in the house? What are we going to do with our our life? Do we have what is necessary for her to continue to live without me there? I mean, there's a lot of questions. And uh, it was a very long process, um, trying to gain weight back, trying to monitor blood levels. um, And that all took place. Actually, the, the weight loss started a year ago in July. So this is pretty recent. But uh, after six months of chemotherapy, um, they've been taking all of, my, um, all of my numbers, my blood margins. Everything is in the range of normal. The last three CT scans, there's not been a speck of cancer. So as of right now, I am cancer-free, and thank God for that. But here's something that I found, and even going back to Caleb, um, Maybe none of you do, but I bargain with God. You ever do that? God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. Or uh, if I do this, will you do that? And then part of that, it's, I, part of the bargain is say, God, okay, we've had enough problems in our life that we, other people should go through this. You know, God, there are some horrible sinners That should be going to this kind of stuff. Not us. Lord, we're in ministry. We give our whole lives to you. We've sacrificed. And so there's this this continuum. Uh, But what we found out, and, you know, I know there's a lot of scripture you uh, you could speak to with this. But the Bible says that he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. And what we have found, a part of what we found in the process is that serving Christ gives us faith to face anything. But that doesn't equate to the fact that God does everything you ask him to do when you're walking through the tough times. I mean, uh, we were not only praying for Caleb all night long, but there was a group of people that the word just got out and they all came to the church and were praying all night for us and for him. And so all of this faith was the bargaining. God, you hear everybody now that we, he should open his eyes and should waken, and he just never did. And the cancer, God, you should, you should heal me right away. What a great story if I walk in Sunday morning and I've gained that 60 pounds. Oh, well, I didn't want all 60. But if I gain some of that back, and, it's a, and the thing is, uh, our faith doesn't dictate to God what he should do because if we're calling the shots, we're God and not him. But what it does give us is the faith to understand that whatever we walk through, it is not without his notice. He sees that. And he gives us strength for every day. And the tragedy of the loss of our grandson and the season that we went through Uh, We don't look at any of those as such an excessive loss that would cause us to not trust in God or to believe that we are immune from any problems moving ahead. To the the opposite of that is, is it really strengthens us to know that we've told God he can have anything, take anything, it all belongs to him. And so uh, there comes time you have to prove that that's true. And even in the most difficult times, you still have to know that you can trust God. He is worthy of our trust at all times. Even in the moment when um, they put us in a, I'll say it's a conference room because that's what I remember it to be. And we're sitting at this table knowing that he probably wasn't going to survive this. And I'm sitting with my 
head in my hands, and I um, just started praying silently to myself. And my daughter is sitting here, and my son-in-law, and I just started praying, Lord, if he dies, I don't know what I'll do with her because I don't know what I'll do with myself. And what do you, you know? How am I going to take care of her? How am I going to help her and help my son-in-law go through this? And I said, Lord, you're going to have to send your Holy Spirit to help her because I can't do it. There's nothing I can do. Moms can fix everything. I couldn't fix this. And even in the midst of this, I no more and got that out. And I could see her move on the side of me. And she looked up at Adam and she says, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And I knew right then and there that the Lord had heard me. I knew that he was going to take care of her. I knew that the Holy Spirit was going to watch over her. And I am telling you, I am so proud of my daughter and son-in-law. They have this had, I can't imagine as a mother, it was hard enough as a grandmother, but as a mother to lose your child. And um, God has done some amazing things in their life. And she is one strong lady. I applaud her. Uh, because that's not easy at all to go through something like that. But it showed me that even at that darkest moment that the Lord was still with us. He was taking care of us. He was going to take care of our family. No matter what transpired, he was going to be there for us. And um, that, that helps so much. That's everything. So uh, <clears throat> in uh, crisis people either, people run to something or they run away from something. So in terms of the Lord, people either run to the Lord or they run from him. What's, you know, I mentioned this before, that one of the things that shocked me over all the years, I've never ever got used to the, the to watching people who would go through something and all of a sudden, Instead of running to God, they're running the other direction. What would you, how would you address that with people in this room? The other, one other thing I want to add to that is uh, uh, what I discovered years ago when Becky and I walked through the thing in the Philippines was in the crisis, what is in you comes out. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't get ready for that. It just reveals, it's like it opens something. Uh, address that and what you think people should do just in the normal uh, unfolding of life to, to ready themselves to face these kinds of times. I'll address the what comes out of you because what came out of me was I didn't realize I was as strong as I was but also the Lord, I think the Lord prepares you. You don't realize the Lord prepares you for certain things in your life, but he does. It, when you walk with him and, and you listen to his voice, even though you go through hard times, those are things that are preparing you for something else. And um, in ministry, we deal with people very often that, that go through tragedy. I mean, we've, we've probably dealt with quite a few people that have gone through instantaneous tragedy with their children. And um, looking back on that, that was preparation for what we were going to go through. But we didn't know that. And so at that moment, um, uh, when, we got to, when we got to the accident, actually, uh, I asked Jean, somebody where Gina was, and she come up to me, and she just crumpled on the sidewalk. And I knew in that moment, okay, you got to take control of everything here. And that's what came out of me. That's, that's what had been put into me, so that's what came out of me at that moment was, come on, Gina, you've got to get up. She had no shoes on even because they lived right around the corner from where it happened. She ran down there with no shoes on. I said, we've got to get back to the house. You've got to get your shoes. You've got to get your purse, your phone. We've got to get to the hospital. And so at that moment, I think that it was... Uh, the strength to deal with her and with what we were going to face, we didn't know. And subsequently through the whole thing, 
Were there times, yeah, I didn't want to get out of bed and I cried and fussed and, and didn't think I maybe could take another step? Absolutely. But I said, nope, I'm not doing that. I am not going to make this who I am. It's not going to be, oh, there's Rhonda. She's the one that lost her grandson. She's, I didn't want that label. I wanted to be strong, and that's what came out. Talk, talk for a minute about uh, how important was uh, the support base around you of relationships that you had. <clears throat> Very important. Our staff um, was amazing. They just took over and um, did anything that we needed to do. They made sure we had food. They, they comforted us. They um, watched over us. Um, and it was hard on them. It was very hard on them because a lot of them had a really great relationship with Caleb and with all of us. But um, our staff, our church people, they were so good to us. And if... If we hadn't had that, um, it would have been really hard because you're alone. I mean, you feel alone anyway because of what's taken place. You feel like you've been set out on this island all by yourself. But then when you begin to realize you have all these other people to help take care of you and watch over you. And Steve and Becky, they were, they were great because they called, they helped and talked to us and, and spoke to us. It, this is why you need a church family. This is why the Bible says don't ever forsake the assembling of yourselves because you're going to find yourself out on an island and when tragedy and things come along, you're going to be by yourself because nobody will know. And you need the strength of the church family around you. You need the strength of your pastors around you. And um, we had that and it meant everything to us. I, I think um, both of those questions, Steve, are uh, great things to think about. Uh, there's something that we found. I mean, you do this professionally. I, I don't know how many people we've stood by them as they found out they had cancer or stand with the family that lost a kid. So it's always somewhere else. Uh, what allowed us to come to the place of walking through tragedies like this uh, was a preparation that we weren't actually, we weren't preparing for when tragedy would strike. We were just preparing by having a solid relationship with Christ and in good relationship with other people. Um, what allowed us to walk through it wasn't because we had some super spiritual strength. It was just the, uh, you know, like Paul says, being instant in season and out of season. Um, my opinion is you cannot properly respond to tragedy uh, and try to prepare yourself in a very short time for that. You just can't. You don't have enough time to respond to making sure re your relationship with Jesus is in a good place. You just don't have the time to do that when it's you. And um, I think the thing that allowed us to walk through both of these was that we had individually, our family, our kids. We, 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 we did everything we could to carry a vibrant, strong relationship with Jesus on a personal level. Our son, Caleb's uh, uncle, has been through a couple of different academies. He worked for the US government, national security, he was a policeman. And I remember him telling me one time, because I was always fascinated, if any of you have been through that, why the military, the police, they make you do the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's such rapidity with their training. And he said, Dad, here's why. Because under pressure, you always revert to your lowest form of training. Now think about that. When you face tragedy, you're going to revert to your lowest form of training. That has to be at such a level in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ that when tragedy comes, you can, you can respond appropriately. You don't need to go off out in space and question everything. There's a trust you have in the Lord when everything is good. And if that's strong enough, you have the trust in the Lord when everything looks bad. So it's the preparation of your life, making sure you're living that vibrant faith. If you never have to face tragedy, uh, thank God for that. 
But when you do face tragedy, though you haven't specifically prepared for it, you have prepared for it because you have that relationship with Jesus. Someone said, uh, at the end of yourself, you discover God. Um, and you guys uh, obviously have served the Lord for many years, the ministry, all of that. Um, just to say a few things about that it's okay to not have all the answers. <laughs> well, it better be. <laughs> yeah, I, I have long before the tragedy came come to the conclusion, I don't understand God. I mean, how can I? Everything we do is measured in, in time and space and uh, tangible things. He is beyond finding out. Not beyond knowing. Um, we have in life and ministry, life us together and with our family and in ministry, come to realize uh, we don't have all the answers. God does a whole lot of things that you can't pull something out of your Bible college education and throw three words out there and everything's okay. I just don't know. There's things we do not know about God. But without still knowing everything about him, I still trust him. I could walk up to the light switch here and turn it on and I can't explain to you all the electronics that gets the power from, the, from wherever the resource is, through all the lines, underground, up the poles, over here on the wires, to that, flip the switch. I don't have to explain how the lights come on when I hit the switch, but I do know when I hit the switch, the lights come on. And it's the same thing with life. I don't have the, we don't have the explanations to all that takes place. But we do know that we can trust God. That when those times come, God forbid any of you would walk through this. Some of you probably have. But the one thing we know is we have a surety that God still is the manager of our life. And it sounds so ridiculous. You know, the thing, all things work together for good. I had people say that to me and I wanted to punch them in the nose and say, how's that working for you? I mean, I... You, <laughs> Everything doesn't sound like it's going to work for good. But the truth is it does. Somehow it does. Without me knowing everything. Without us knowing everything. So there is a trust that we have in God that's beyond having all the answers. So in the, in the immediate and uh, immediate and maybe a little beyond time frame, everything looks dark. And you, and you're sort of reeling, trying to adjust and cope. But when some time passes, there's another story here that you know took some time to unfold, and it will never replace Caleb. But do you mind sharing the other story? It's amazing. So when my daughter was 16 years old, um, she made a bad choice, and uh, she got pregnant. And uh, she, we sent her off to counseling and, and everything, and she ended up making a decision, and we let her make this decision. She made the decision uh, to place the baby for adoption. She came to us and she said, you know what, mom and dad, she says, look, I want this baby to have a mom and dad like I had a mom and dad. And um, so pretty, pretty astute for a 16-year-old. So she did. She found a family um, through uh, Bethany Christian Services and placed this baby for adoption. And she saw her, we all did actually, when she turned a year old. She want, that was one of the stipulations that she could see her. <clears throat> and after that, she didn't have any contact, except that every year until she was, I believe, maybe 13 years of age, I'm not sure, um, the family would send her pictures and these beautiful letters explaining the whole year and what she'd done that year and so on and so forth. And 
she looked just like Gina. It was pretty quirky. But um, so time passes, Caleb dies, and um, about four years, I think it was after Caleb died, um, we had, on New Year's, we always, our family goes somewhere and goes, either goes camping or, or we go spend some time some to wear together. And we had, were with Adam and Gina, and we'd gone to breakfast, and Larry and Adam were waiting for the food, and Gina comes over and she sits down beside me, and she hands me her phone. And she goes, Mom, read this. And it was a message on Messenger, and it said, um, Hi, my name is Summer, and um, I'm your daughter, and I would like to have a relationship with you. And, uh, but if you don't, that's okay. And Gina's crying. I'm in shock. She says, what do I do? I go, you answer her. I said, that's what you do. And she did. And a month later, her and I flew down to Southern California and uh, got to meet her. And um, if you saw her, um, my other granddaughter, Lola, Gina, and me, it's like having one person at four different stages in life. It was pretty incredible. And she's subsequently built a really strong relationship with her. She calls her mom. Uh, they just had a little boy about a year and a half ago. So I'm a great grandma. She's a grandma. It's kind of weird. But um, it didn't replace Caleb, like Pastor Steve said but it filled something in my daughter that the Lord knew she needed. I always figured at some point in time she'd come back into their life. <clears throat> and I told Gina, you better tell Caleb and Lola about her. And she never got to tell Caleb. But um, Lola has a sister, so it filled a little bit of a void in her. And uh, Adam isn't her dad but it has helped him a lot. I'll tell one other thing. Adam and Lola are a lot alike, and so they butt heads a lot. And uh, I know he just missed Caleb terribly and really thought he's a contractor, so he probably really thought that Caleb would work with him someday. And Lola has been through her challenges because of Caleb dying, but she really has turned a corner. She's doing so well. And uh, she doesn't make enough money at the job that she has. So Adam one day said, you know, I need somebody extra to come and work with me. And Lola goes, I'll go with you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, really? You're going to go and get drywall on you? Or what are you going to do? You know nothing about building a wall. But she has. She has uh, gone and started doing construction with her father. And uh, it has helped their relationship. You know that's just the whole plan. God knows. God knows what needs to happen. He knows what needs to take place in people's lives. When we think tragedy is the end of everything, that that's where life stops, it doesn't. It doesn't mean you're gonna ha not going to have uh, obstacles afterwards, but those obstacles have turned into beautiful things. And... Um, my daughter gets to have a relationship. She gets to be with her grandbaby. And Adam has somebody that he can work with and build a relationship with. And uh, so the Lord knows all things. Um, <clears throat> Before we end, in this size group, there would have to be some folks here who have walked maybe not in your exact circumstances, but certainly through things where life was not fair. And uh, if maybe you're there tonight, maybe you're, you haven't been able to move past that. Maybe the pain is really deep. And... Um, you came tonight. Maybe you didn't even know Larry and Rhonda were going to be here. Maybe you read the things we put out. You came because of that. But I wanted to uh, end this time by uh, just ministering to you. This is uh, Wednesday night is our prayer meeting time. Um,
which we'll go to in just a moment. And uh, this, this pre-prayer time that we've just had, generally there's one of our pastors that are, that's bringing a teaching during this time. Um, but I really felt like uh, Larry and Rhonda talking out of their heart and out of their experience would be uh, helpful to some of you. And uh, so we want to we want to end by praying for you. And if you need prayer tonight, I'm going to ask you to just stand right where you are. You're you're in a time like this. You need prayer, or you've had a time like this, and it's really difficult. Then tonight we want to pray for you. And if you need prayer, I'm going to ask you to just stand right where you are. I'd like to, um, do we have a number of the prayer team here tonight? Okay. If you were, did you, Bob, did you, you spoke to some folks to help? Okay. If Bob and Julie spoke to you about helping, we'll see how many we have. I'm going to ask you to get up and walk to some of these people and stand with them if you were. And our, all of our pastors should be a part of this. And if you were part of the prayer team that, so that I'm having someone stand with you because we could pray for you from a distance and it wouldn't alter the power of the prayer. But no one needs to stand alone. When you walk through these kinds of times, you, and maybe you have a great support group around you, but maybe not. But for this moment, uh, someone standing with you and tonight we're going to ask the Lord to uh, do what we cannot do. Yeah. For God to minister in a way that's, a, that a, that's actually unexplainable. When Isaiah 40 says, Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. All of that's preceded by a chapter in which God reveals himself to a group of people that when he comes to the end of explaining who he is he says why do you say O Jacob that your just way is passed over don't you know don't you know and then he talks about himself and his strength and then ends with those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, Larry, I'm going to have you and Rhonda pray just as you would. However, that is either one, one of you, both of you should for the folks that are here in this room tonight. If you want to pray for us, let's stand. Go ahead. I'll do it next. Father, in Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, you know the needs of these people, Lord Jesus. God, for every one of these. You know the hurts in their heart. You know the things that they face every single day. Maybe it's been tragedy. Maybe it's been sickness. Maybe it's been family matters. Oh, God. But, Lord, you know every single one of those things. Yes, God. And, Lord, I just pray and ask for comfort, for peace, for wisdom, 
for healing. Yes. Whatever it is that they need at this moment, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. That you will reach your hand down and that your Holy Spirit will come upon them, Lord, and touch them and meet them where they are. In Jesus' name. That when they leave here tonight, Lord Jesus, their hearts will be lighter. Yes, God. Their faith will be stronger. Their trust in you will be better, Lord Jesus. Yes, God. Because they know where their hope lies, and it lies in you, Lord. Yes. In nothing else, this world can't satisfy us. This world can't do anything for us. Medicine does its best, but ultimately, it's you, Lord. Yes, God. It's you, Jesus, Yes. that helps us in every area of our lives. Mm. Yes. Lord, I pray these things over each and every person that is standing. And maybe there's some that couldn't stand yes. because it was just too much. It was too overwhelming. Or maybe they felt like their faith wasn't at that point. But Lord, whatever it is, Lord Jesus, you speak to them tonight, Lord. Yes. Give them the hope that they have not had. Yes. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, you have identified yourself. We didn't give you this title. You gave it to yourself. And that is you're the God of all comfort. Not some, but of all comfort. Lord, I pray that right now the comfort of your presence would come to each one. Without all the answers, you still bring us comfort. So I speak that comfort over every heart right now. In light of every loss that has been experienced, every tragedy, You're still the God of comfort. Come, O God, and bring comfort. And Jesus, you said that you would leave your peace to us. You said, my peace I give to you. And I pray, O God, that right now your peace would come over every mind and over every heart. That we would, as your word says, find rest for our souls. So Jesus, bring your peace. And all of the questions we have that that aren't answered, all of the things that we shuttle in our minds, even responsibility that we take for the things that have happened to us, Lord, I pray that your peace, your comfort would be stronger than that voice in us. I pray, oh God, that even through this season, we would be able to say, God, I still trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Some of you need to say that right now to God. I trust you. I just don't get it, but I I trust you. And with all of this, Jesus, whatever those things are we have experienced, here's what we know. There will come a day for us when we go to be with you. We'll know as we are known. We know that that's a place where you will receive us. And some of those folks, people in our lives that have gone, we'll see them also. And your word says that knowing Jesus, you're coming back, you're bringing them with you, and we will be caught in the air with them to ever be with you. You say we comfort each other with those words. So Lord, we thank you. And it could be tonight that we're caught up in the glory. And all of the pain and the struggles we've had will disappear in your presence. 
So Lord, we speak these things over every heart and every mind. I pray that for some who have been without sleep because of the discomfort of the season, that tonight, as your word says, we find rest. Bring this to each one. Bring this to each one. I pray in Jesus' name. And Lord, for each of these who are standing here and someone standing near, in just about every case, if not everyone touching the human touch, I pray, Lord, you'll do tonight what we cannot do, that you will wrap your everlasting arms yes, around each one of these people. That while there is the human touch, that human touch will transmit something of your supernatural yes, God. touch. You'll, by your spirit, you'll hold people close. And in that embrace of the divine, <coughs> because you said your Holy Spirit would be the paraclete, the comforter, the one who would walk alongside to help us as we walk through life. Tonight we pray for that. Yes. Supernaturally now, even now, in this room, would you minister as only you can to these folks? I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.